What's up, everybody? Brandon Lilly here with the Be Legendary podcast by Sornex. Today, I'm sitting with Ryan Horn, making a name for himself. Absolutely one of my favorite coaches to follow. Got his start, um, Virginia Commonwealth University, tracked his way over to Tulsa, and now at Wake Forest University as the director of athletic performance for men's basketball. Ryan, welcome to the show, and how you doing, man? I'm doing phenomenal. I appreciate you having me on. I, I forgot what the title was of the podcast that I heard be legendary, so I'm getting a little nervous now. I, I <laughs> <laughs> Far from a legend, but uh, hopefully we can uh, have some level of productive conversation here. For sure, man. And, and the reason that I think you're a standout, obviously, I, I don't see you work every day. I, I'm not in the in the weight room with you, seeing how you interact with your players. But the respect that I see you get from from other coaches as well as um, your Summer Strong presentation at Summer Strong 11 was fantastic. And the motivating stuff that you put out there uh, through your Twitter feed and also shared to Instagram just fires me up. And I know a lot of times for myself when I'm sharing information or I'm sharing content, I'm also kind of holding my feet to the fire with what I post. And I wondered sometimes if that's not only your way to self-motivate, like you, you oftentimes will give highlights or things that coaches should be thinking about or focusing on rather than a lot of the times the shift towards being popular on social media and whatnot. Is that something that you wrestle with as you gain, I guess, recognition as someone who just shoots it straight from the hip uh, dealing with that Insta fame, I guess you could say? I'll use the term, I don't know about Insta fame. I don't know if I'm famous or anything like that, but, uh, you know, I, I see it more as like a digital diary. Um, so anything that I put out are just thoughts and maybe little nuggets and, and pieces of information and things that I'm chewing on as a person. And right. what I've tried to do is, you know, maybe use some of that perspective and the insight that I have to hopefully just help someone. So instead of being apprehensive about sharing it and being, you know, worried about what other people are going to think, you know, how other people are going to respond, instead of hoarding that information, let's use it to hopefully help someone. So Absolutely. I think that's something for me, like Gary V, I think, says it best, you know, you're not necessarily creating content you're documenting your life and i think yeah. that there's a big difference between creating something daily and just documenting where you're at and what season of life that you're in both professionally and, and personally well you know it's funny you say that um I, I think that's a perfect way to state it i mean uh gary v has obviously done a lot of a lot of work on the internet and the sharing stories and motivation and whatnot but I've even had situations where people would be like, hey, we'd love to pay you to write a squad article or we'd pay, love to pay you to do this or that. And, you know, sitting on the sidelines, not being able to train for a long time or just kind of feeling disconnected from my training, I couldn't even do it for money. But whenever it was like I was in the gym and I was training and I was going through the motions, that's when I'm most creative. That's when the thoughts come. That's when the observations come. And it allows me to write. So I totally, I totally dig that. And I relate to that. How old are you? 35. I just actually just turned 35 last Thursday. Okay. So happy belated birthday uh, from all of us you. at Sornex. And uh, more than that, man, you have this, because uh, I'm 37 and you just have this way about you. You seem so much younger and enthusiastic, but you also seem so much older um, with your ability to, to analyze Growing up in West Virginia, as you did, um, how how much of your childhood kind of impacted your outlook on life today? Honestly, I think we're all reflective of our experiences. I think a lot of things that I'm passionate about, things that I kind of kind of help guide my direction and, and help navigate this process, is all you know, built upon the experiences that I've had. So growing right. up, you know, I have two, my parents are, are blue collar. They worked at General Motors and auto factories their entire life, working shift work and doing that. So they always found a way to provide. My dad was at every single one of my games, every single one of my practices. Uh, he was a coach growing up. So I've had, you know, a blue collar upbringing, but at the same time, I, I had two parents that in their own way, um, we all have our, our positives and negatives, but in their own way found, you know, the ability to provide and the ability to make sure that 
we had opportunities that not all, you know, everybody gets the chance to have. So I'm very grateful that I had parents that supported things that I was passionate about and, and my brother was passionate about. So, you know, my upbringing, you know, from, you know, obviously the time you're born and going through middle school, high school, college, I mean, everything that I am now is a reflective of that. Right. I think that you have to lean on those experiences and, and not run away from them and, and leverage them. So, you know, you made a comment about, you know, being energy and, and, and being positive and things like that. A lot of times that's me projecting things that I need to work on personally. Sure. Well, you know, I get that. So part, so part of the reason why, you know, I'm so trying to project and, and, and trying to increase and reflect what I want, you know, projected back at me is, is the fact that I'm dealing with things internally. You know, sure. I deal, you know, with anxiety or I deal with negative thoughts. I, I deal with those things on a daily basis. And to help combat that, I try now to shift my focus to hopefully impacting someone else. And then you, you find a way to make yourself better in return. So it's kind of that whole reverse economy, so to speak, you invest in others and you give, um, to get that back in return. So yeah, definitely. I think, uh, definitely, hopefully everybody, um, is reflective of the things that they've been through. How do you, how much, uh, kind of pushback do you get, or you kind of celebrated in your local community as someone who got out of West Virginia? Cause Man, and, and nothing against West Virginia as a state. It's one of my favorites and, and the people and the food and the culture is, is very deep and and it's it's a beautiful place. But there's a lot of sadness in West Virginia, you know. There's a lot of sadness in Kentucky as well. And it seems like if people leave, um, sometimes they're kind of looked down upon as maybe they think they're bigger or better than, than others. And I've never felt that way. I just felt that if – if I could get out of here and do best by myself, I mean, obviously I've come back and, and I live here now and I love it. Um, do you ever go back and visit? And do you ever catch any of that kind of flack? Yeah. You know, I, I think the state of West Virginia, I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's a, it's a big state um, that population wise is, is pretty dispersed across the state. And, and, you know, I'm from the Eastern panhandle. Um, so uh, if you t- okay. ask any real West Virginian, um, they somewhat claim us, but yet they don't, <laughs> um, you know, we're a little bit closer to Northern Virginia and, and, and a little right. bit closer to Washington, DC. So, you know, I can't fully take a, you know, wear the belt of a, of a true West Virginian, but I, but I think there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of inspiration in the hollers and in the places in West Virginia with the history that it has with coal mining and, and just hard nosed people just with a lot of grit. Um, and I think in a lot of those small towns, no matter what state you're from, you know, I had the opportunity to go back. I had the opportunity to go back in the fall um, for a hall of fame ceremony um, for our high school and just having the opportunity to one, understand that I, I don't go back enough and I need to do that more. Sure. My wife is actually from, um, our hometown. Um, we've been together since, you know, middle school. So we've known each other for a long time and have gone through those stages of life. So she's from there. She's actually one of the first ones in her family to move away, um, from our town. So that was a huge bridge that she needed to cross. So I think there was some pressure there. And I can remember looking back now, um, when I first got my, my first internship, I remember some family members, you know, looking at me and kind of saying like, how are you going to support a family doing that? You're going to leave this place to go do that, to go right. chase a, you know, a pipe dream and a fake job. And, and it, and it hurt a lot. It, it was a visceral response for me. It was a very emotional response. And I think that, that, that scar that it left inside of me, you know, it's not necessarily the most positive thing, but that negative moment um, was was fuel yeah, um, for, for sure. my fire to, to show you, yeah, I'm going to take care of my family. I'm going to do what I love and I'm going to find my purpose and then find my passion and allow that um, to help me provide for my family. Um, that, was a, that was a big motivator. But yeah, going back, I, I still see that. And it's, it's, it's crazy because you get lost in that moment and you realize how proud people are of you and how they're supporting you for afar, even if you don't hear about it. Um, and it fills your heart with joy. Did you almost, did you almost have a moment where you're like, Oh shit, these people know better than I do. They're a little bit older than me. They have better perspective. Did you almost hesitate on, on pursuing your dream at that point? I, I, there was, there was some wavering there. I actually, uh, when I was a junior in college, my, my wife got pregnant with our son and there was a wavering point where it's like, do you chase the real job or do you run after 
the fake one, as people say. You right. know what I mean? Do you go for the the quick fix? Um, do you go do that now? Or do you live with resentment that you didn't chase that? And actually, my wife was the one that said, don't live with that. I, I don't want you to live thinking that you settled and that you quit. And I've had a lot of experiences in my life where I, I gave in and I settled um, and I quit on myself and I quit on other people. Um, and that was a turning point for me that it, I wasn't going to allow that to happen this time. So I, I wavered. Um, but I think most of those great decisions and those great moments are built off risk. Um, they're built off fearing that. And I think that's what propels us to really take that step to go into something that ultimately is going to give us a huge return on the back end. But it's a, it's a dark place walking into it. Dude, and to go back to something that I really want to shine some light on, you said you have been with your wife since middle school. I mean, how many years in, in total have you guys spent together? Yeah, we've been we've been together. We've had a couple spots there when we were in off and on. But I mean, it's over 20 years now. Um, so you you talk about being 12, 13 years old. I actually met her. She was a cheerleader um, for my for my youth league football team. Yep. Um, and, and I had just moved to West Virginia. My parents, we moved from Michigan. Okay. My parents got transferred um, from a General Motors plan. And and I remember she was one of the first people that I met. Um, but for that moment, it was kind of crazy having someone like that looking back now as like a focal point in my life and someone that I can lean on unconditionally, it's, it's been huge for me. And I, and I spoke about it and I, and I, and I shared some of those thoughts that some are strong, right. but I, I, I honestly, I don't think I'm here um, without her. And I, I know people say that and it sounds cliche, but I really don't. I mean, she truly is um, my rock and, and she truly is someone that I lean on and, and she's been a godsend for me and, and a blessing for sure. How many kids do you have? Two or three? I have two. two okay. um, yeah, my son's going to be 13 yep. in, in August. So whew, he's he's making a big jump right now. That's a, that's a crazy transition. He's turned into a little man. So that's always cool um, yep. to start sharing different experiences with him. And then my daughter, she's seven. She's going to be eight. Um, and she's I don't think anybody in my life in history has ever had as much control over me as that little one. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not ashamed to say that she's a daddy's girl and that I got She's got me wrapped around her finger. So. Well, that's awesome, man. And I, I really do. You know, as, as I think as a younger person, um, culturally, we're told to kind of sow our oats and get out there and, and spread our seed is, you know, kind of that's kind of a weird way to put it. But that's through media and through history, that's what they tell you, right? Get out there and get it out while you're young. But as someone who kind of buckled down and, and committed to someone, I really have a lot of respect to that, um, especially seeing that you guys have worked on it and worked through it because I know you're not the same person that, that you were as you at the same time as you met and to have evolved and grown together. And really, truly, when I saw you guys, it looked like there was a partnership, a happiness, a contentment. And I don't say that with any negativity whatsoever. Sometimes contentedness can be um, viewed as a negative viewpoint, but it's to me, I thought it was completely beautiful. So I give you a lot of props on that. Um, how, how much does your family get to see you as a, you know, you as dad, you as a husband versus you as the coach? You know, I, early on in my career, um, I don't think I did a very good job of making them a part of my professional life. You know, I viewed it as, you know, they were at home, I was working, you know, I'm, I'm trying to climb that ladder of coaching. And it was two separate lives. I was trying to balance the two things. And I think a across the years that I've been in the field, that was my biggest problem. I was trying to balance things that should never, ever, ever weigh the same. Right. So, oh, absolutely. So you're trying to balance these things that can't be balanced instead of just you know, then you're looking at, okay, maybe I need to have work-life separation. I need to be fully present, you know, you know, 10 toes down, be exactly where my feet are and be present with them no matter what time I get. And, and I made strides on that. Then I realized, okay, now I've got this work-life separation. You know, my quality of life has improved. My relationships with my, with my children and my wife have improved, but why can't they be a part of what I do? Why can't they come around the weight room? Why can't they come to, to pre-practice, you know, and shoot arounds and game day and things like that. So it's, it's been this, uh, you know, this evolution of, of balance and, and the illusion of it. And then to this work life separation and to now I want them to be, you know, a part of that. I want them to experience and be around our players. I want, you know, my, my athletes too to see, 
the life outside of the weight room. And that's why social media has been such a, you know, a powerful tool, not only in my life, but also connecting with our kids because they get to see that, you know, that coach Horn is, is also dad. He's also a husband. And, and I think that it's cool for them to see what happens outside of the four walls of the weight room and at practice. And it's cool for me to see too, as well as what they're doing. So I think that, uh, you know, that's been huge. Do you, do you realize, I mean, systematically how different you are um, just in talking to you for this 15 minutes. It's like you're very counter to the culture that I'm, that I'm accustomed to. And I, and I don't say this just in the strength and conditioning, but I just say the culture of men. Um, I know that a, a lot of men compartmentalize their lives. You know, they, mm-hmm. they have their professional life, which usually entails, you know, their buddies and going out to the, to the bar or to restaurants with their buddies after work. And then they transition into the home life where they're walking through the door and they're their dad, they're the husband, they're, they're whatever. And then, you know, it's also their, their private life, which is like something to the effect of their hobbies or their own things. And a lot of times there's not overlap. And I'm wondering if it's something that you saw in your father, if it's something that you just adopted through failure and through mistakes to be more open, like you said, you know, in the beginning you weren't so good at it. So how did you evolve to this open mindset? Because one of the things that I really, really strive for, and I, and I can't say that I've ever fully had it, um, is this idea of the naked truth and the ability to have someone to to really be so completely open with. Because there's there's humor that you'll share with your, your boys that you won't share mm-hmm. with your wife. There's humor that – and there's things that you'll say, you know, uh, let's say just about an, uh, an attractive female um, that you might just say, man, she's – she looks amazing. She's gorgeous. She's this, she's that, that you wouldn't necessarily necessarily say in front of your wife. But I think somewhere in the middle there, there's like a balance point where it's that woman's beautiful, whether your wife's sitting there or not, you know, it might, it might change the way that you say something to it. But I really do believe that if someone is your equal partner, they have fair game to any of that stuff. You know, they have fair game to your understanding. Is that a beautiful woman? And it can become a conversation or it can become you know, a point of, of positivity rather than, you know, jealousy or disagreement. And I wonder if you have that kind of balance where anything's on the table and you're, and you're very open with her because I just don't see that very often in men anymore. And I don't, I don't think it's a systematic failure of men. I just think it's a systematic failure of culture where we've stopped communicating. You know, I think, you know, from a central standpoint, you know, to the core of, of who we are, I think honestly, you got to let what you love just leak out into all that you do. And I, and I think that that level of connection should really, I, I've tried to compartmentalize and I just, I, I was just left feeling unfulfilled. You right. know, I was left feeling, you know, whether it's my faith or whether it's something else, you know, you want to be a Christian on Sunday, but are you letting that love leak out, you know, the other six days of the week? Are you letting that, you letting yourself be, that and I tried that, you know, and I, I tried that earlier in my career, like I've already alluded to. You know, yeah. I had coaching, you know, I had powerlifting, I had these different things, and it's amazing that you're doing all this stuff, right? But you never really ask yourself, like, okay, I'm setting these goals, um, I'm trying to reach these certain levels in every aspect of my life, but did I ever ask myself, like, who am I setting these goals? Who are they for? Right? Are they really for me? Or are they really for someone else? Do I want to squat a thousand pounds because I really want to squat a thousand pounds? Or do I want to squat a thousand pounds because I want to get the attention and the admiration of the people I look up to and also the people I look down on? I want them to respect me. Sure. So I think, you know, I think that process for me, both, you know, mentally, emotionally, you know, physically, that's something that I, I do agree. It's not always a, a common place in our culture among men. Um, but you can use your vulnerability, you know, as a weapon and, and not as a weakness. Right. And I think that's the true sign of a man. Like, I don't want, you know, my son to look at me um, in a way that he's not able to articulate and express his emotions. He's not able to, and, and I kept those bottled up. You know, I had a lot of emotions growing up that weren't discussed and I was afraid to talk about them. And it took me a long time to realize that it's okay 
to not be okay. It's okay to talk to people about, you know, about pain that you're having, about happiness, about success, about fear, about failure. Like these are these discussions. And when you don't hold on to that, you know, I was watching this show this morning, actually, and it, it made a point of, a, of another thing of like trying to drown your sorrows and, and, and good luck with that because they know how to swim. And I think if we, you know, really try to run away from those things and we try to bury them and push them down, you know, ultimately everything's going to come to light. So why not just, you know, not necessarily let it eat you alive, just breathe life to it um, and get it out and, and don't carry it anymore. Absolutely. And I think something you touched on right there is is very important that I, I am struggling with this right now. I have an 11 year old son and he's soon to be 12. And one of the things that I kind of analyze consistently is that my life was much different than, than the life that he has inherited at 12 years old. Um, mm-hmm. Not that my parents, my, my parents probably sound a lot like yours. They were very blue collar people. They worked a lot of hours. That meant that my grandparents watched after me a lot, meant mm-hmm. that I was a, a turnkey kid or a latchkey kid for a long time. And, you know, that allowed me to get into certain types of trouble, certain types of adventure, uh, not all bad, some very, very good stuff. Um, but my son kind of lives in this bubble relative to the life that I lived, which was, you know, it seemed like I had a scraped knee or a scraped elbow or a black eye or a busted tooth or a broken nose. It seemed like these were just ongoing reoccurring events throughout my childhood because I was so rough and tumble. Whereas he's, he's been involved in sports. He's been involved in a lot of the same things, but there there's a much more nurturing home life for him and a much more supportive. I would say in that there's actually dedicated time to, Hey, what's going on at school. Let's talk about your feelings. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. And while I appreciate seeing him open up and evolve into that, like you said, a lot of this negativity turned into the fire that became Mm -hmm. the fuel for, the success that I feel like I found through sport and am now finding in life. It was, I've definitely thrived with a chip on my shoulder, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm not so sure that he's developing that chip. And in one way, as a father, as a parent, um, I'm looking at that, like, yes, we're doing our job. But then at another time, I wonder if he's going to have the same desire to succeed or if it will just be like the expectation. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with you 100%, and I go back to that as well. But I think the greatest lesson that we can give our kids is just love. Um, yeah. and, I, and I truly believe that. And it's not the sense that you're enabling them or you're pampering them. You're preparing them. And I think that you're not looking to necessarily make sure they're always happy, but you're looking to engage and to equip them and to prepare them for that adversity, not to keep them from it. Um, right. You know, I'm far from that. Like, I'm not the guy that's going to try to, you know, necessarily prepare the path for my kid. I just want to prepare him for the path, as the old adage goes. But, you know, like, it, I think those are the discussions that you have because when they come to that adversity in those situations like much like you I, I grew up not with a chip on my shoulder I had a boulder on my shoulder you know because <laughs> right. I was yeah. you know because I was bullied and you know I was an overweight kid you know I was a, a fat kid I could be honest with myself I wouldn't probably say that to somebody else but I could be honest and you know a lot of the stuff that the bullies were saying to me um, and David Goggins talks about this in his book you know a lot of what they said to me was true I just didn't, you know, I just didn't like it, you know, and then, and and I grew up being bullied. I'd be growing up, you know, being self-conscious of the way I looked and, and and the way I felt Um, a lot of what I looked like on the outside was having a huge impact on me internally. And that's one of the reasons why I gravitated to sports and to lifting weights. I mean, you ask anybody that trains, uh, there's some level of insecurity there. I don't care who they are. Um, I mean, everyone I've talked to, you don't want to get big and and strong and, and those type of things for just because you woke up one day and you're like, oh, I could be better. Um, yeah, you know, there's absolutely. some type of pain there that you're trying to do that with. And I go through the same thing with my kids, but like, I don't never, I don't ever want them to feel that they can't come to me and we can't talk about this, you know, and I think that you have to just be consistent with that. You got to be demanding on them. You got to try to set the standard, but I think the best way they're watching you and they're watching me, they're watching how I'm dealing with adversity at work. They're watching how I'm dealing with losing, how I'm dealing with, you know, the rigors of my professional and personal life. And the best thing I can do is, is be the standard um, For sure. and, and be the person. And I'm going to make mistakes and I'm going to own up to that. And I think that that's one area that I'm trying to teach our children now is to do 
difference between accountability and ownership and having a level of internal drive to really push past that. But I, I truly believe that the way the world is, um, they're going to experience enough adversity. Sure. I mean, other, other people are going to set that up for them. And I think that, uh, but yeah, that's my mindset. Well, so you're, you know, you're in a, this is a perfect segue. You're in a sport where there's a lot of temptation for these young athletes that are highly skilled. You, you, you know, you work with basketball, um, mm-hmm. the one and done mindset, at the collegiate level, I think is problematic. I think it's, I think it's a real issue that we're facing, not only for the athletics departments, but just for society as well. You know, it's like, I have to do this bullshit to get to the real stuff that I want. Um, so, you know, and I, and I think it's a real problem, but coming from the background that a lot of these kids come from, how do you connect with them in a, in a day and age where there is such an entitlement? Um, we hear that over and over and over to the point that, I believe, I don't want to misquote, but I believe it was Tubby Smith that was critical of these kids that are coming into a university. They don't like the coach. They don't like the system. They stay a year, not necessarily getting the best draft uh, looks, so they transfer out, you know, or it happens in football too. But we're allowing these kids to just leave instead of sticking it out. It was Tubby Smith because he said his, he wanted to quit uh, the Army at West Point, mm-hmm. and he came home and his dad said, you won't have a bet if you come home. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, that used to be the way it was. Once you started something, you finished it, unless it was just unbearable. And now these kids have so many options. There's so many back dealings that go on to get these kids to come to schools and whatnot. How do you as a, as a coach, as a, you know, and I want to say this, as a 30-something guy from West Virginia uh, that has really done, from my viewpoint, you know, against the grain in, in a way that we would classify as right, you know, you met the girl young, you, you were honest by her, you stayed with her, you raised your family, you know, you, you check the boxes of doing all the right things. How do you connect with some of these kids that come from just unbelievably difficult, terrible backgrounds? You know, I would almost flip that on you and say, you know, maybe what's inspired me to, to try to do things, you know, whether people classified, I'm not going to take any moral high ground, but if you took classified or as right as wrong, I mean, they inspire me just as much as, you know, I inspire them, you know, sure. and I, I think that they give you responsibility. You have a responsibility as a coach, as a man, as a mentor, um, to help them along that path. And, and I honestly, I don't even concern myself with, the level of entitlement or if they want to transfer, if they want to stay or anything else, you know, I I think I'll drive myself crazy like that because, you know, we yell at these kids and we blame these kids. Oh, these, these millennials, they're entitled. They give up, they quit. Well, someone raised them. Right. And, and a lot of times the ones that are complaining about them are the ones that are racing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a viewpoint. If you want to change kids, you got to look at yourself as a parent. You got to look at yourself as a community in order to build these kids up. And I think that you do have to put them in situations, but the first things first, I, I think it's hard to put yourself in someone else's shoes unless you untie yours first. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of times we'll project our insecurities onto other people. And, and I just don't consume myself with that. I try to be, what I told these kids I'm going to be. Yes, I'm from West Virginia. Yes, you know, I'm a, I'm a bearded Caucasian man that is working with kids that may have not had another Caucasian in their life serve as a positive person for them. Right. You know, they may grew up with a negative connotation or a negative relationship of that, but part of being able to immerse yourself, you know, into their lives and become a, a piece of their lives is you got to be able to just be yourself and be relentlessly positive and unapologetically demanding with what you're doing and be consistent. I think that's one of the great things about athletics. And you mentioned this earlier, like these guys keep me young um, to a rel- you know, they yeah. keep me connected. You know, this is a, this is why I'm in college as well, because I love this age group and being yeah. around these guys and having that segue with my child kind of, you know, growing to that age as well. I think that I've spent a little part of my earlier career trying to figure out who I wanted to be as a coach and then now I realize now who I am as a coach is a reflective of who, is I, who I am as a person. So I'm not trying to create anything. You know, I spent yeah. the front end trying to create this coach, this persona. And then I realized I'm not a professional wrestler. I'm not, I don't need to create a persona. These aren't promos. Like I just need to be myself. And the, and the right. better I am as a person, the more comfortable I'll be as a coach and the more impactful I'll be as a coach. So when guys come into this program, I tell them straight up, our interns and our assistants, you're going to deal with these guys. You're going to work in small 
small numbers. You're going to work one-on-one -on -one with them and they're going to see right through you. If you're full of crap, they're going to know you're full of crap and they're going to tell you you're full of crap and you're going to lose that respect and you're going to lose that consistency in your ability to reach them. So you better learn how to connect and you better come correct or they're going to know. And I think a lot of times if you're trying to fake it till you make it, yeah. these guys see right through it. So I think a lot of the times it was just a huge relief to me to say, you know what? the better human I become, the better person I become, just be yourself. Just be okay with who you are and what you're trying to do. Don't try to be anything else. Don't work to improve, you know, work to improve. Don't worry about trying to be something that you're not. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, you know, my coaching got better. My ability to connect got better. I got more patient. I got more in tune with what we were doing. I was more present. Um, those things created a better dialogue between me and the kids, but I understand their backgrounds. I've had kids that have ate out of trash cans. Yeah. They came here, they put on 15 pounds and everybody's like, Oh yeah, look at my before and after pictures. Yeah. The kid didn't have any food. Yeah. yeah. He put on 15 pounds because when he came here, he got the basic necessities that a human deserves food, water, a warm place to sleep at night. He wasn't bouncing around from house to house, from couch to couch. And now he's actually getting someone to help invest in him and then support him. And it's reflective in how he's producing. That's all that was. It's not because I'm some, you know, upper echelon elite strength and conditioning coach, you know, and I, I think that's a, a key part of what we do. You got to be careful, you know, of that. You got to help these kids, but at the same time, you know, be real and be honest with yourself and what you're really doing and what you're really trying to achieve. So, you know, you talk a lot about the impact of real and the impact of, of who you bring into the fray. So a two part question for you. You know, when you walk into a Wake Forest who at the time that you took the reins, uh, the basketball program was somewhat in disarray. Um, you know, I don't want to infer anything there, but it, it just looked like I, I remember some of the glory days of Wake Forest and they were not on that when you walked in the door. So walking into a situation where, you know, the university is somewhat reeling from previous seasons, uh, you're trying to right the ship. How do you one? How do you create culture? How do you? you know, take over and, and implement positive in a place that doesn't have a lot. And then two, how do you select your staff regard? Is it more selective on the, the program in front of you or is it more, you know, selected on people that you've worked with in the past that, you know, can work well with you just at any situation? Because I've seen both, you know, I've seen coaches that will hire strictly for a situation and I've seen coaches just continuously bring the same staff that they can retain along with them. Uh, you know, that's a loaded question. And I'll, I'll try to go, you know, uh, attack it piece by piece. Perfect. You know, first things first, you know, coming into a program, um, program, but especially people, people aren't projects. Um, they're not something when you come in, you try to fix them. You're trying to do these things like you're trying to meet them where they are. And so when, when I come into a program or when I came into this job and this position and we came into this position as a staff, you know, I'm not trying to necessarily fix anyone. I'm trying to see where these kids are and I'm going to meet them where they are, understanding where they've been understanding where there are and then ultimately where we need them to be so they can help themselves and in turn help our program. So I, I think it's not something necessarily that needs to be fixed. And when you're looking at that culture, um, the big C word that everybody throws around, I think a lot of times you think of this culture piece as like a puzzle that you get the right pieces in place, you get the right people and you just put this puzzle together and then you're good. But I would more compare it to like a Petri dish. It's this living, breathing thing that's either fueled or put out by the daily actions and the people that you have. Are people pulling the rope in the same direction? Are you going in the same direction? Are the actions and the thoughts and the interactions and the collisions, not really bumping into people, but the collisions you have within people in that organization, is it something that's helping you get towards that purpose or is it something that's taking you off course? So I think for me, it's about being consistent every single day. And with our staff, I don't hire positions. I hire people. Right. Like I want people that want to be here, that want to coach, that want to make a difference, that want to really invest not only in themselves, but invest in people. I don't want fans. I don't want you know, people that are coming in trying to just to move up the ranks. I want people that want to come in and make an impact. And I can't tell you the number of people that I hire that I get 
resumes in. I don't even really look at the resumes too much. That's probably a weakness of mine, but I just Skype and I want to get in front of you and I want to have a conversation with you. I want to know that you want to make us better and that I can make you better. I want to know that I want to be around you and you want to be around me, that I'm able to tell you the truth and then you can tell me the truth. So hopefully we can get better. And I think that's a huge piece for me and the staff that I keep around me. It has to be people that I trust it has to be people that are going to be honest with me. It has to be people that I want to be around. And in turn, I think that synergy leaks out and, and, and it really impacts our athletes as well. But that, that's my process. Like I didn't come into this thinking it was anything but what it was. Right. Um, and, I, and I started off, I can, I, I still remember to this day, you know, you go from one place, you build it up, you're there for a couple of years, you got a core nucleus of guys, you're rolling. It almost gets too easy, but I'm a sucker for, for really – trying to get things going in the direction that you want to see. I've always gravitated towards the the kids, the guys and the girls and the athletes that were hard to reach. Those are the ones I always gravitated towards. No matter what the sport was, that's who I gravitated towards. And even when I came here, I mean, we started at one area and we had to get to another, but it's been every single summer, every single block, it's been something different. And we're far from where we want this to be. But my only goal is to leave the people in this program – leave this position and leave these, you know, everyone that's kind of invested that's came through here as a part of our staff to leave them better than what we found it. Like that's really the only goal. Um, and I think that so far we've been able to do that in some areas and in a lot of areas, we still have a lot of work left to do, but that's what makes this job great. That's what makes this, this profession great is the ability to do that every single day. And I think that's something that, uh, that you got to lean on. You got to embrace that. Do you feel like, uh, you know, it is a meat grinder. I don't care. You, even if you're at the best of times, it's a meat grinder, right? Because it is this day mm-hmm. in, day out. Mm-hmm. We got to bring it. We got to have the, you know, we got to have the momentum through every, through every block. Okay. It's spring ball. It's summer ball. It's, yep. you know, it's preseason. It's whatever. All of these things require a high demand. Dude, how do you unwind from this? Like, how do you? How do you find the time to shift off of it? Because I know one of the worst cases of burnout can come because you are so dedicated to the job. You want it to do so well and you take on so much responsibility that it's hard to turn that off sometimes. Do you find yourself struggling with that or do you do a good job of unwinding? Oh, man. I mean, I struggle with it so bad that I almost left the prof- the, the profession. Um, there was a point in my career where – I lost sight of that. Um, I tried to be everyone or everything to everyone and and I got spread really thin. Um, It affected my home life. It was affecting my work life. Um, I reached a tipping point and and I fell off and and I only not hit the bottom, but I hit the bottom and bounced about 40 feet up in the air and then went down and hit the bottom again. And I think, uh, you know, that was honestly a turning point for me. and, And I realized that, you know, burnout is real. Um, you know, no matter how waking up at four o'clock in the morning and putting it on your Instagram story and and you're thinking that it makes you tough and and return, it really just makes you tired and and you're not really able to adjust the things that you're doing in your life to make the best impact. But you, you put so much into other people that you really forget that a burnt out fire lights up no one. Right. And I think as a coach, we forget that we want to be everything to everyone and you can't light other people's fires. If yours is burnt out, like it just doesn't work like that. So I think coach health, um, you know, as far as your sleep, your hydration, everything that you need to be the best you, because that's what the athletes expect. They, they don't like when you have bad days, they got this persona of who you are, and, and what you bring to the table and you're requiring that of them. So you got to give it to yourself. Now I only work with 17 guys now, but I've been back where I had six, seven teams and, you know, early in my career, I've done that too. Um, and and it, it presents unique challenges at every single stop. It's done that, but you know, I burnt out. I mean, I was pretty much no fire left. And I think what happened was, is I lost sight of my purpose. And I talked about this at summer strong. Yep. It's like, once you know your purpose, you'll never have to manufacture your passion. And what happened was I was relying on my passion and what, and I, and it wasn't something I could stand on. And then sooner or later, I just, I just crumbled because I lost sight of what my purpose was. And in order to re- fulfill my purpose, I have to make sure that I'm investing in myself as well. And that was a huge turning point for me. And I'll never forget. I called my mentor, you know, at VCU, Tim Contos, who's like a 
like a freaking brother to me that, that, that molded me in this profession. And I've spoke with my wife and I called people that I trusted and they all had the same thing to say, you know, it's like, you've put this work into this, you've put so much into it, you know, is it the job or is it you, Right. you know, what can you do? And I got, I reached this point where I was pointing fingers. I was working too many hours, you know, the coaches were picking on me or, you know, my, my situation, I wasn't getting paid enough. I wasn't this, I wasn't that. And you become immersed in this negativity. And sooner or later, it's all you see. It's like, you want to get a new vehicle. You want to buy a, a freaking new truck. And everywhere you look, you see that truck. Why? Because you got your eyes open. Now you notice because you're looking for it. Right. And then that's what happened to me. I became negative. I became critical and I became no one that you really wanted to be around. I was falling asleep at the dinner table. You know, I wasn't spending enough quality time with my children and with my family and with my wife. And I wasn't as impactful at work. So I reached that tipping point. And for me, I had to burn out like I had to hit the wall to really do that. Some people could get you know ahead of it. They don't have to reach that point. Um, but I reached it. I mean, I, I hit that wall and, and, and it was a turning point for me, but then my best coaching honestly came after that point. And I think that any big jump that we've had, any big peak that we've hit is, has came after a pretty dark and low Valley. And I think that's just something that you have to understand. Well, You've got to take those punches. I'm so glad you went into that right there and, you know, and, and acknowledge that it is a cycle, you know, and I think sometimes I have this uh, conversation this past weekend with a really good friend of mine. And they were, they were commenting. They're like, man, I've seen how much you've changed and grown. And I want to, I want to be like that. I want to be on your level. And I told them recognize, okay, yes, I appreciate that you, you acknowledge this change and this growth and this evolving, but here's the thing. This is not static. This is this wave. This wave is not going to be here forever. And over time you start to learn that, yeah, the dark is going to come. There's going to be some, some undersliding that's, just unavoidable. But the sooner that you realize it's part of the process and not, it's, it's not the world crashing down around you or it's not the world making you the, the problem and the victim it's, it's all choice, right? So when we start to get comfortable and we start to think, okay, this is finally sailing out. Like you said, we kind of take, take loose of the reins a little bit. We kind of sit back and kind of celebrate and what happens starts to come apart at the seams a little bit. You get some bad news, you have some bad falls, and then you pick yourself back up. But the, the the true evolving is understanding how to catch those signs sooner, right? And I think mm-hmm. that for someone like yourself, um, I'm really glad to hear that you're aware that no matter how good it is right now, um, you're either going to probably be moving to another job at some point or it's going to be a new town, it's going to be a new team, it's going to be a new staff, whatever it might be that can all be the undoing. It's like, man, I was so much happier at Wake Forest. I was so much happier here. We were doing this. But if you don't pick yourself up and start moving forward, it's always going to stay that way because Wake Forest is always going to look better than the next place or the next place because you're relishing the past. How much mm-hmm. of that do you do you feel within yourself, you know, coming from a Tulsa where you had a great opportunity with Danny Manning and, the, and that team um, to really kind of re- build something cool there? to come into this new place and it's like, man, I've got to start all over again. Or, or was it just recognizing that it's part of it? You know, I I was a little bit different, you know, coming into the field because I never really set out to work with football. I never really set out to work with basketball. I just wanted to coach like the, one of the defining moments of my career was, you know, just getting my first piece of mail. I just want to be a strength coach. Like I, that's all I wanted. Like I didn't care in my first teams. I worked with field hockey, track and field, um, and, um, and men's soccer. That was my first teams. And I didn't really play any of those sports. I never seen field lock hockey in my life. I didn't even know they played <laughs> it on grass. And, and those are my sports, but guess what? That was the most important thing to me at the time was just having the opportunity to be called coach and to be able to do something, um, that I've been chasing. But I think, you know, looking back on it now, it's just, and it's part of the reason why I am the way I am now is like, I'm not going to have this platform forever. And, and what are you going to use the platform for? Like you said, I can get hired, I can get fired. And the people around me, the same people that helped me get hired are the same people that are going to be around me to help pick the pieces up when I crash and, and get fired. And I have that circle of people that I can, you know, really rely on. And I'm extremely grateful for that. But like, 
right now, you know, I dealt with a lot of that throughout the field. You know, my path has been relatively unorthodox. You know, I, I went into situations just trying to be the best coach that I can be. And I think on the front end, I was more worried about me. I, I love coaching. I love connecting with the guys and the girls. and I love training all the teams, but I wanted to be you know, the coach, you know, I wanted to be viewed as smart, you know, I wanted to be attached to other coaches that were doing things in a certain way. So I'm writing these programs to impress my colleagues and to show them how smart I am or how big of words I can use (laughs) or whatever it may be, you know, and it's like, and that's just not the case. And it's like, you know, you go through this evolution of time, you know, whether it's sports science or technology and like, it's just like money, you know, if you don't have any sports science, I remember first starting out, I went into Dick's Sporting Goods and bought a heart rate monitor for our soccer guys. And we used to just rotate and use it. I didn't have much money at the time, but I wanted to be cool, like Mark McLaughlin and, and, and James Smith and Buddy Morris and those guys. So I wanted to get the heart rate monitor so I could say we we're doing it. But we, you know, we found a way. And I think over time, if you can't manage that, you can't manage the big weight room space you yeah. know i've had space where i've only had a couple racks when i first started out robert morris we only had a couple racks and we had the whole football team and you had to find a way you had to find a way to make it work and if you can manage that well now you can manage it when you have a little bit more at your disposal but i think that to spend my time complaining or or portraying this thing as perfect or this field as is always being something positive or being something negative i think honesty helps and it not only helps me i think it helps other people and i haven't always been like that but the number one word you said a little while ago one of the most impactful words is awareness like if you don't have awareness how are you going to help the kids and how are you going to help yourself i think awareness is huge but i to run away from it or try to keep that stuff bottled up like that's not help like you're not going to find a chapter in the book about how do you make it to your kids' practices and, and how do you do that? That's not going to be in the CSCS manual when you're preparing to get certified as a strength right. coach. They don't talk about that. You know, how do you deal with contracts? How do you deal with salary? How do you deal with hours? How do you go from job to job? Like, how do you develop relationships on the carpet, not just in the weight room? So I think, uh, you know, all those things kind of play into what we're trying to do. How much are you feeling like a, a voice or kind of a beacon for some of that stuff? You know, to be a guy that can say, hey, I'm not saying this is the the way to do it, but it's really an opportunity to to watch my life. You know, I am going to make my kids practice or I am going to learn how to negotiate a little bit better. How much of that are you trickling down to your staff? And then how much do you think that you have the potential to trickle that out to the the profession as a whole? I think there's a lot of areas, you know, with that. You you have to look at like when your guy comes into your program or or a young lady comes into your program and you're, you're trying to make them a professional. Like you're trying to, to show them the ropes of how this business works and, and how the field works and how do you be an impactful professional. And that's not only in the weight room and on the track and on the field, you know, it's at practices, it's in your community, it's it's on carpet, it's meeting with the administrators, it's golfing, you know, with boosters and donors. It, 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 there's a lot of ways that you're trying to build connections with people that are willing to not only invest in you, but are willing to invest in these kids. And I I don't try to be a beacon of hope or a a voice of reason. I'm just trying to share. And I think we confuse sometimes with, you know, visible for viable. And you see a lot of people run, you know, running to be visible. They're running to put stuff on the, on the Instagram. They're running to put stuff on their story. Like they're sitting around daily trying to find something to post just to post it. Like, and if you ever notice myself personally, there's weeks where I don't post anything because I got nothing to say. Like I, I if I don't have anything to say, I don't say anything. If I don't have anything to post, I don't post anything like that's just because like I said before, it's a direct reflection of where I'm at. And there's times where I just want to delete the dang thing, but I don't because if I look at my messages and I look at the people that I've met and I look at the people that I've spoke with, like, I don't want to let that go. So whenever I go to a conference and I go to a place or I'm at summer strong or whatever it is, and someone comes up to me and they said, you know, I really appreciate, you know, the stuff that you do, the stuff that you post, like I'm still like really humbled by it because I don't necessarily see myself as that. But like when I hear those conversations, like that's a huge, 
you know, it gives me a huge amount of joy um, to hear them say that and just have that discussion with them. And it's funny because they're like, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm Rachel from this little school. Or I'm, I'm just this. And I think that's one of the worst things I hear with coaches is when they preface everything with I'm just, you know, I'm just a GA. I'm just an intern. I'm just such and such at a D3 university. And I think that's the problem because we're approaching, you know, if I'm approaching you like, oh, man, this is Brandon Lee. No, I'm having a conversation with a like minded individual and another human being. It's like the Dalai Lama says, the Dalai Lama doesn't approach people from the place of being his holiness. He approaches them as another human being because it helps him deal with the anxiety and the responsibility of the position that he's in. And I think we can take a lot of that and apply it to coaches with those conversations. But I've been big time. I've been pushed to the side. I've got people not call me back or not answer questions. And then some of those people are the same people you're having dinner with when you go to conferences and clinics or that are calling you. So I think that you don't want to hold on to that. But at the same time, like you've got an opportunity to make a difference. And if you really want to help kids and help athletes, you know, help coaches. But yeah, I don't, I don't see myself necessarily as anything, but just someone that's trying to share, you know, the things that I'm going through and the things that we're doing and, and, and that's it. And, and, it, and, you know, part of the reason for me being real is because I spent a lot of time in my life being fake. Right. And, and I realized that that fakeness and not being genuine and not being authentic and not being honest with myself and fear of being rejected minimized my ability and minimized my potential and my ability to be, you know, intentional with what I was saying, with what I was doing, because I was afraid that what people are going to think of me. Like now I know if I don't create, if someone doesn't have a, a comment disagreeing with something that I said or something that I put out there or that I'm just on my high horse or whatever it may be, and that's fine. But that lets me know that I'm saying something, right. that, that I'm doing something that people can really either gravitate towards or relentlessly push against. And I'm okay with that. But that's part of my reason of trying just to be, genuine is because I've spent enough time of my upbringing in my earlier years being fake, trying to be something that I thought someone else wanted me to be. Um, And I think that's what, you know, I think that's what's, you know, reflective now. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, I even look at myself in the powerlifting uh, circle and, you know, I, I look at my life and I, like I said, I kind of had a tough upbringing, not the, not the worst by any stretch, but it was, it was tough. I was the youngest kid in a pretty tough neighborhood and Um, I was, I was the test experiment for a lot of things, you know, can you jump the ramp or, um, why don't we put you on the, on the nose guard here and we'll just let Andrew, the biggest guy in the the subdivision run you over every play. You know, it was, I was kind of the, the whipping child, I guess, in some ways, but I look back at my life and I think, you know, all I've ever wanted was to be accepted, right? All all I've ever wanted is to be uh, liked and understood. And I think, I need to, to say, and I've said it on here before a couple of times, but when you, when I looked at myself, I didn't necessarily know that I was faking it. You know, I, mm-hmm. I got these tattoos, I got the shaved head, the beard, all of these things, which I, you know, I, I like that look. I like that style. Um, so it was authentic to, to what I wanted, but it's a little different than wanting them for my own reasons, not for someone else's. And I think that part of the faking it is almost mimicking in a way. And Mm -hmm. I think it's a part of the process. I don't know if a young coach at at 22 or 23 years old can stand proudly and say, you know, I know exactly who I am. I've been through this shit, you know? So I think, you know, I get the concept of faking it till you make it, but also understand that faking it isn't necessarily the worst thing. I think if we could redefine that into something else like mimicking or whatever, it might be Mm -hmm. a better way to really to look at it. But I totally get that feeling now. Like, when I people comment on my hats or, you know, the way that I, that I, way that I dress now versus always being kind of tied to sweatpants and a sweatshirt, you know, being 340 pounds, but to be able to, to change myself, people are like, well, which guy was it? And it's like, I'm a little bit older now. I'm a little more comfortable in my own skin. I'm a little bit more um, attuned to who I am. So this is who I am. This is who I've always been. I just didn't know how to express it. And I think in a coaching world, you know, someone being, 35 at the helm of a, of a D one university that's as respected as yours. Um, I think that that could bring you a lot of flack, you know, kind of speaking from the mountaintops, but you've remained this sense of humble, uh, throughout your posts. Like I, like I told you in the very beginning of this conversation, I've never felt like you were just preaching. I thought that you were somewhat contemplative about yourself and you were sharing pitfalls that maybe you've seen or you've seen others have, mm-hmm. 
I think that's an awesome responsibility. And I think to have faked it to a point where you're making that change is almost worth it. I mean, how do you, how do you direct a young kid that's fresh out of college and say, here's what I would do different, but here's the things that I would tell you to give me a couple points. I think for either side of that argument that you would give yourself again at 22 or 23 years old. Yeah, and I, th- and I think you you brought up a great point with with the fake in it. My issue isn't necessarily you got to find a way to fit, and, and I think fit in in the sense that you have to find. There's going to be positions that you're in that you, might be the only opportunity that you have, and it's not a great fit for you. So you have to find a way to make that thing work. But to me, when I hear like you know, fake it till you make it, or even like, I love what you said about mimicking, you know, to me, it's more believing in it until you really achieve it and you reach it. So you believe in yourself and your ability to to push forward and do what you need to do, but you never compromise your character and you never compromise those things. And it takes time. Like the guy I am right now and the man I am at 35, I hope to heck, I'm not the same person now that I was when I was 20. For sure. Um, and I, and I think that, we have a responsibility as guys that have, when you've been in this field for over a decade, you're like in rare air because people just don't stay in the field. It's not something you see a lot of guys retiring, you know, as coaches. So as you continue to, to make your way throughout this field, I think you have a responsibility to just show that process of what you went through, not to tell anybody what to do, not to criticize them, not anything like that, but to understand it. Like, The things that you're sharing and the things you're giving forewarning about are coming from a place of experience, not from a place of judgment, right? So like when I talk to a young coach, which I have a terrible time saying no, like when, you know, we go to a conference and I love talking shop and I love seeing young coaches and I love trying to help them because I've been the guy when I went to my first conference, I still remember this in San Antonio, Texas at the coaches conference. I remember going there. I had one polo that I got from an exercise science department at the university that I was at, but I had zero connections. And when I tell you, I didn't know anybody, like I literally knew no one. And I wasn't even training with collegiate athletes at the time. I just figured that was a place that I needed to be. And, and walking around that room with all those goatees and all those shaved heads and, you know, nylon jumpsuits, it's like, holy crap, like who are all these people? You see these logos and and you see these people and it's like, I don't know any of these people. Like, how do I ever get to that point where I want to be this? And you start chasing, you know, these logos. But the whole point of this podcast, like logos don't leave legacies, like investing in people do. So it's like coaches are coaches. And there's plenty of guys that aren't active and aren't out there on social media that are achieving great things with the kids and the people that they work with, whether it's big time schools, small time schools, like you kind of make the big time where you're at. But I think that's the responsibility. Like I don't expect a 22 year old guy, like even coming into this field, I asked them, what do you want? Right. And they're like, what do you mean? What do you want out of this field? And they're like, well, I really want to serve people. I really want to make an impact. Like, yeah, I get all that. But like, what do you want? Right. And they're like, well, I want to be able to provide for my family. Okay, how do you want to provide for your family? Um, Well, I want to be able to make sure, you know, my fiance doesn't have to work or whatever it may be. And I want to have children and I want to make sure I can do this. Okay, so what are you willing to do to get to that point? And it's like, you want to do it, but now there's a battle between want versus will. Now, how are you going to get that point? And is this job you have now interning for whoever just so you can put it on your resume because the the logo is right is that really making you a better coach because the coaches i worked for and the mentors i've had made me a better coach they made me a better professional they invested in me and some people don't even know the names of who they are but they made an impact on me and at the schools and teams and sport coaches i work with so like what are you really chasing Right. Are you chasing notoriety? Are you chasing, you want to walk around the conference and say you work at such and such? Is that what you're chasing? Because if it is, so be it. But what are you really chasing? What do you really want to achieve? Now, pick the job, pick the places, pick the coaches, pick the people that are doing the things that you want to do at the level that they're doing it at and ask them how the heck they got there. And I've been there. When I first got in the field, I'm like, Olympic lifts are stupid. You should box squat everybody. Even if they only squat 90 pounds, you put bands on the bar, box squats only, no free squats. Olympic lifts are stupid. You know, and I go to these, these places and I watch coaches and all I did was pick out what I didn't like instead of asking myself, how do they get this job? How do they keep this job? How are they doing a, a, you know, a service to their student athletes and their administrators. How are they doing it? What do they do really well? 
and my perspective started to shift. So now when I go on site visits and I meet other coaches, I'm trying to basically feed off their fire and figure out what they do well. You know, what do they leverage as far as their 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 strengths? You know, what do they leverage to make themselves better? That's what I want to learn about. Now, I have no time to argue about preferences and, and, and argue about little little things that I like more than what you like. You know, I, I really want to learn about that person and really learn about what makes them tick and then how do they reach you know, a level that they're at now, then how do they stay at that level? And I think that's been more important for me. So that's my advice to a young coach, like put it all out there. Don't wait to share. Don't wait to try to help someone. Don't wait to try to help your kids figure out what you truly want. Understand it. We already talked about it. You know, the first five years for me were absolutely brutal. Yeah. Now it's all relative. I wasn't, you know, in the service and, and fighting for my life and fighting for this country. Now that's all relative, but in my season of life, like the first five years, you know, almost broke me, but it's also what defined me. For sure. Um, so I think those first five years were huge. So now as you work your way up, it may not be the same situation, but the decisions you're making are more impactful. There's a little bit more risk involved in certain areas. But that's my question to young coaches, like how are you going to make a difference? You know, what do you want to do? And then now what are you willing to give up? What are you willing to do to make that thing happen? So I think that's always my my thing. But I don't want anybody to ever shortchange themselves based on where they start who they are because you know my path has been relatively orthodox and and believe and chase that path if you think that's what's best well that's a i mean as this whole thing has gone that's been you know just fire after fire actually talking about (laughs) doing stuff in the moment and staying connected dude i just want to give you so much props because i went straight to the instagram story and i was like we're 48 minutes in and ryan horn is on fire like this is this has truly been one of my favorite podcasts. So before we wrap it up here, I want to hit you with a couple quick questions, okay? Okay. Um, one of my one of my favorite classes that I ever took was from Craig Ballantyne, and it was his perfect day formula. And he was like, "We're all working for something, like much like you said, um, we're all working towards a goal." But so many people don't define what that is, and he narrows it down to this perfect day in your life that where everything that you've ever done and everything that you've ever worked for comes to a culmination. So what would your perfect day be? Um, if you could define it and what you're really working for in this life, what, what is the perfect moment? I, I, this is going to sound cliche, man. I'm looking for progress, not perfection. Right. I don't even think, I don't even think about perfection. I don't even want to, because, because like you said before, like, the, the perfect isn't what makes life enjoyable. It's not like, like right now I watch you like, and, and we, we've only really connected for the last couple of year, years here. Thanks to, you know, your connections with Sorenex and, and other platforms and social media, but I watch you playing the guitar. You love music. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And, and I watch you, you know, really relish the opportunity to be a beginner again, yep. like to learn something like you were at the top of the top, you know, you're an elite power lifter. You're doing that. You know, that was somewhat stripped from you. So you got to find another way to find somewhere where you can make progress, where you can be a beginner, where you can challenge yourself, where you can make yourself uncomfortable. So for me right now, I have this crazy idea in my head that I've always been a strength athlete, you know, power athlete, football player. Like I want to do an Ironman. Yep. And I, and I put that out there and help keep myself accountable, but also to show people like you got to find ways to challenge yourself. Like, and I'm as far away from that right now as I possibly could be, but run, bike, swim, like that's what I'm doing right now. It's completely different. I'm only training in the weight room a couple times a week, but it's progress. So for me, perfection is progress. Like perfection for me is being able to wake up and to be able to, know and define and understand that I'm going to have the opportunity today to, to chase and to invest into my purpose. And then part of that, my passion is already interwoven in that. So like being around the guys coaching, like that's my passion. So for a perfect day for me, am I going to have the opportunity? And it sounds simple. I love taking my kids to school. I spent the first five years of my career, never going to a bus stop, never dropping them off. Part of that was my fault because I wanted to be the first person in the office and the last person to leave, even though I had nothing to do. Um, but I <laughs> wanted to put on the, I, I just wanted to put on the persona that I was a grinder. Yep. Um, so I miss bus stops. I miss picking kids up. I miss donuts with dad. I miss daddy daughter dances. I miss those things. And, and to me, taking my kids to school, dropping them off, starting my day off with the things that I love most and truly legendary. Like they're, they're legendary. And that's what my legacy is going to be. That's the only way it's going to live on is really through them. 
and dropping them off and then going to coach, which I do like today and having the opportunity to coach and have an opportunity to be around these kids and invest in them. And then being able to one, put myself in some level of pain, um, put myself in some level of challenge, like right now, like I said, doing the whole triathlon thing and then going home and being around my wife and my family and my kids again, I want to make more dinners. So the fact that if I can get home for dinner and share that dinner at the table, which you, you don't realize if you miss enough of those, you relish yep. them and having the opportunity to be around the table and express, you know, what we're grateful for that day and be around my family and eat with them. Um, you know, that's a perfect day. So if I can drop my kids off, I can coach, you know, I can work, I can come home, I can have dinner with my family, I can watch some shows or do some things with my wife and be present with her. Um, those are things that I want to do. Those are things to me are perfection when I start investing in experiences, not necessarily in the things I can basically ingest and consume and basically get my hands on. So that 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 that's my perfection. That's I mean no denying that that is, I mean, that sounds awesome to me as well. I mean, you know, I think sometimes we, we shoot too big when really we should just look at what we can perfect around us in each day and let that be enough. You know, I think that's an awesome answer. Uh, last question for you, man. Uh, best book you've read lately, best documentary and favorite song on your playlist right now. Uh, best book. I actually, I really enjoyed, I'm a big fan of Bob Goff. Um, he has, uh, two books I actually went back and, and read them again. Everybody always and, and love does. Um, those are two of the most impactful, um, and two books that really resonated with me. I think it's important to, to find things that when you read them, um, really impact you. And those are ones that I listen to. I listen to a lot of books now because yep. I'm on the road, I'm on the bike and I'm doing things a lot. So I've been, I've always shied away from that because I thought it was kind of cheating, but I realized how much more I'm getting done. So now I audible books and if I really love them, I buy them. Yeah. Um, and those are two, those are two that I listened to that I had to go out and buy. I also did really enjoy David Goggins book, especially the audible version. Um, you know, can't hurt me because he had a little bit of basically mini podcasts at the end of every chapter. And I, and I appreciated his story. Um, we don't see eye to eye on everything, right. um, but I appreciated his his ability to be vulnerable and to turn that into something that can help you know weaponize other people uh, and, and arm them and equip them with the ability to confront their own demons. I, I thought that was a phenomenal read. Hell yeah! Um, as far as favorite favorite song on the playlist um, right now, I don't know. I I, I kind of just play the the XM. I got free XM in my car <laughs> right now, so I've been I, I just been enamored with being able to like move through the uh, the stations right now. But I do listen to a lot of uh, uh, mostly reggae and some 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 worship and some different things, but awesome. I'm trying to just kind of keep it eclectic. But yeah, I don't really have a favorite song Sweet. right now. But yeah, no, I get that. And last one, documentary. Documentary. Or movie. Um, if, a, if you got a good movie, do documentary or movie. Yeah, the, I actually just watched uh, um, the Dawn Wall. Oh hell yeah, um, that was great. Yeah, yeah. I really, en I really enjoyed that because I, I really respect the hell out of it and just people that are just relentless uh, on just being basically consumed by things that they want to achieve. And, and I really respect that. I, I really looked at lifters and powerlifters and strength athletes for a long time. I grew up loving those guys. Like, like when I got a chance to meet Kaz at summer strong, I swear it was like, Oh man, I was so starstruck. <laughs> I was a little fanboy at the moment, but, uh, but no, I, I've really shifted and learned to appreciate other areas, endurance athletes, um, you know, uh, ultra marathon runners, climbers, you know, explorers, you know, I'm really fascinated with climbers, especially that just see something there and just know it needs to be climbed because it's there. And I think that's something to me that's, uh, that, um, is extremely, um, motivational and just inspiring to see guys like him and Alex Honnold just do what they do. So, yeah. Well, hell yeah, man. I mean, that's, this is about as fun a podcast as I've had. The hour went by so quickly and um, I hope it's the first of many Ryan, you are someone that I look up to and respect for what you're doing and um, in the weight room, as well as through social media, I think you're using it the best way possible. So thank you very much. You do define what it means to be, be legendary and I'm proud to know you, man. Thanks for coming on here today. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And it's funny because we didn't talk any X's and O's. Exactly. Uh, we didn't we didn't talk any training. It's kind of funny how this works, and and I know we got to go, but you know, you, people out there listening, coaches, there's a time and a place. Um, 
you know, for discussing programming and periodization and training. Um, but we spend more of our time being yeah. people and, and being human. And, and I think you got to take, take a little, take a few moments a day to kind of invest yourself into that. And, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come on here, man. I've been wanting to do this for a while and I'm really glad we can connect, man. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Thanks a lot, man.